Now then, team, it's a very, very warm welcome to the High Performance Human Podcast. Another episode on this bandwagon of brilliance. And I tell you what, this episode is one that was always going to happen. And it was one that um, I had, as soon as I thought about putting this podcast together, there was one name that hit the list immediately. And that is my old mentor and good friend, Rick Rushton. He is a keynote speaker, a best-selling author. He is a life coach, a business coach, a mindset coach. He is a communication and connection specialist. And aside from anything else, he has got a mind and a viewpoint on the world that allows him the opportunity to talk to some of the most high-performing individuals in lots of different fields, be it sport, be it business, be it health, whatever. Rick has seen it all and he's been around and shared stages with some of the very, very best. And it's an absolute privilege and an honor that I get to call him a friend aside from anything else. Rick, welcome to the High Performance Human Podcast. How are you, sir? Well, I'm enjoying this opportunity, that's for sure. Couldn't wait to say yes and couldn't wait to get underway. I'm I'm so excited. I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. So, Well, but you and me both, you and me both. And this is the way the Rick rolls, gang. Uh, this, this is a very much an off-the-cuff type thing, but this is where Rick excels generally because there's a few people that uh, I think there's many people in uh, sort of leadership or speakership type roles that uh, are good with a script, um, but then the very, very best are the ones that can do it on the fly. And he, this man is one of those now rick um a little bit of a preamble my man with the high performance human podcast we've got a firm belief that there are four elements that go into making a high performance human uh be it success connection influence and happiness but before we crack on uh i want to find out a little bit more about you so if you could uh, for the benefit of our listeners give us a little bit of an mo as to who you are and what got you to this point in your life Oh, thank you, buddy. Who I am is a lifelong learner, I think. And it's that curiosity that's kind of allowed me to continue to connect with people right across different industries, across different age groups, across different specialities, if you want to call it that. But I'm uh, somebody who gets asked to come into organizations and work with their teams to help them connect with each other better. So it's one of your core four pillars by the sounds of it. That's pretty handy. I get called the communication coach, which is realistically where I spend 80% of my professional life helping people communicate better with themselves first and foremost with their self-talk and then with their ability to collaborate with others because as we both know mate there are no successful hermits success is not a solo performance we need to communicate and connect better and yeah, for three decades, I've kind of stayed predominantly in the sales professional selling space, but have been able to get into elite sports programs. And that's really been where I can see the dupl- the duplicity, if you will, of what I do. It seems to work in the sports arena, in the professional arena, and more importantly, in the home arena. So that's what I sort of suspect is what I do. And I say I suspect because I still find that each day I'm asked to do things that seemingly are outside my range, but I'll say, yeah, I'll jump in and see where that takes us. And uh, so this is a great opportunity today to just share some of those learnings, if you will. I oh, look in there. The honor of Willie is absolutely all of ours and team. Uh, make sure you've got a notepad and a pen handy because there will be a number of little sound bites. I'm absolutely certain uh, that Rick will spout uh, that you will want to make sure that you write down and remember. This is absolutely going to be one of them podcasts that you're going to listen to more than once. Now, Rick. First things first, we always ask our, our uh, esteemed guests that come on to this show uh, what their, defini- their definition of a high-performance human is. So tell me, with all of, of the people that you've been exposed to and the amount of uh, education and knowledge and awareness that you've built over the course of your, uh, your career and your life, what would you say defines a high-performance human in your mind? Oh, great question. I mean, it's very clear to me that... The simple answer, Andy, is is that it's going to be different for each person, but the one common thread that seems to just run right through every high-performing individual, high-performing culture, high-performing group or team is quite clearly when their values are clear and the behaviour aligns, they're successful. So I think the real simple answer is for a peak performer, for a high performer, 
if they're living in alignment to what they value, Andy, they are living a successful life. And so, you know, it's a bit like that in a compass, if you will, values determine and drive everything. And the very best seem to be very clear on what it is they value. So if they're clear on what they value, they can get alignment to it. And when you're in alignment, you're in work-life flow, probably. So I think that's the simple answer. I like that. Tell me, from your point of view, from your perspective, when did you really start to feel this sense of flow with what you do and how you go about your life? Because um, you've obviously been in, in a couple of different uh, chapters in your work career and your work life. You've got three incredible children and an even better half uh, in your life. So tell me, where was there ever a point in your life where you where you really got hit over the head, shall we say, by life and thought, you know what, I really need to get clear on what my values are here. Well, I think it wasn't one particular moment, but there was probably not a year that went by in my early 20s when I was questioning what the hell was I doing? And mm -hmm. I think I got to the late late stages of my 20s in nine, well, probably when I was about 28 and I just thought, no, hang on a sec, if this is really where I'm going to spend most of my waking hours, I'm going to do it with something that has a bit more purpose behind it. And I was going to work, Andy, to get meaning and purpose. And then I realized the clever hack, if you will, was to bring meaning and purpose to what I was doing. So, um, you know, I was constantly working on what my job was at the time, but also looking to develop the skills to get to what I passionately believed I could do, which is, you know, the engaging with others in high performance, the engaging with others in, you know, better mindset, better communication, if you will. So I don't think it was one moment in time, but it was clearly uh, maybe spending too much space and time in the wrong arena that made me realize I probably didn't want to stay there and play there for the rest of my life. So, you know, for me, it was no real single whack over the head, but it was lots of little moments where I thought, you know, uh, I, I what I value is collaboration. What I value is connection. What I value is working in teams. I'm not into solo anything realistically. Mm -hmm. So I love that concept of communicating and collaborating. So if I thought to myself at the time, I thought, well, if that's what I love, let's find a way of sort of making that the main purpose and main focus of your daily professional life and see where that can take you. And so that's been an exciting journey ever since I was 28 and I'm sort of closer to 60 now than any other number. So I'll let the uh, participants in this podcast work out the math. When it comes to when it comes to your values around collaboration and and uh, you know and connection, where where did it become that obvious for you that they were your values? Because I think that a lot of people that'll be listening to this podcast will be trying to work out or ascertain where what their genuine values are. I know that I had my first set of values in inverted commas were very much built around a mindset towards commercialization as opposed to what they actually were and and it took a little while for me to really probably accept that accept that they weren't what I it was sort of I was trying to project what I thought I needed to be instead of being who I actually was so from your perspective like when did it become or how did you really really nail down that those were your values because it's been quite clear uh, over over gosh gosh a, a long long time that that has been your true north for that entire time. Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately, when we think back to when we're at our best, what are we doing in that moment? And for me, I knew I was always at my best when I was out of my own head, when I was in the company of others, when I was, you know, playing in a team, if you want to call it that. Um, I, you know, I do throw a lot of sporting analogies into my professional talks and, you know, I love high performing cultures and I've been very fortunate to see a lot of them from the inside out and get to work collaboratively in them. And so for me, Andy, it was realistically a case of what was I passionate about as a, a young boy growing up? When was I at my best? When, when did I feel I was, you know, at my happiest? And it seemed to be in those moments. And then it was a case of working out, well, now, not so much how can I make that part of what I do professionally because you know money isn't everything but it's right up there with oxygen and I coach people that all they want to do is make a, a truckload of money and that's fine if that I'm not going to be arrogant enough to say that shouldn't be what they value if that's what they value let's get them to to the space where they're earning more money but for me um you know my, my number one value is family happiness so for me to create a happy family economically I have to show up 
Mm. Uh, but I also have to show up as a husband and a father and, you know, a brother and, you know, ultimately in, in my wider family and extended family, there's lots of things there. So I think how do you find what you truly value? Most people find what they value, Andy, when they don't have it anymore. So, you know, one of the things for me was, it's, it, so like we don't, we don't value money. It's the lack of it that makes us value it. Mm. It's not that we value love, but if we're not having anyone to hold hands with on the 14th of February every year, we start questioning what's it all about. So, yeah, for me, it was very, very clear growing up the way I grew up uh, in the in the sort of experiences that I that I had as a as a young lad, it was very clear to me when I was at my best. It was very clear to me when I was at my worst. And I wanted to spend more time in my better version of me. And and I realized that was in collaboration with others. And what do I value? You know, I value my family structure. I value my family setup. I value uh, effectively friends and family uh, above all else. And yet, you know, what we know about that is if I spend all my time in family space, I'm probably going to annoy my wife. I don't think that's going to serve us well. Um, and for me to provide in our family unit economically requires me to sometimes be away from them. But that's what helps me to, you know, maybe produce what I produce when I produce it, because that's really one of the things that I that I truly value. Now then, Rick, I'd love to really dig into the some of the people and the experiences that you've had working in some of these high performance cultures and high performance individuals and whatnot, because you're a, I think it's safe to say you're a bit of a, an observer of life and you're, and you're very good at, at observing people's behaviors and mechanics and looking at what's going on behind the, the superficial, right? And, and I've always admired that about you. Now you work with some, like we've mentioned, some of the, some of the real highest performing athletes, coaches, um, sports teams, environments, so on and so forth. When it, I've got this thing around high performance human beings, when because you look at the where you look at where a lot of these high performers uh, operate, and they are very, very one eyed as to what they do and where they're about and who they are about. But it generally comes with a degree of sacrifice. From your perspective, when it comes to being elite at something. Is it possible to be able to be elite across everything, or is there some, or is it is it a case of we're going to end up being human at some point and stumble at some stage or another in another part of our life as a result of having to focus on the one big thing? Well, I think the first thing is that you know when you talk about high performers and you know you use the word sacrifice, high performers don't see it as sacrifice; they see it, that's the price I pay to be the best I, I can be at the role I, I believe I play in the game of whatever their sport is. So from the outside looking in, it looks like sacrifice. From the inside out, they see that as the price they pay. But they don't spend a lot of time on the opportunity costs. They actually just look for the opportunity and they worry about the cost later. So, you know, to be incredibly elite at what you do, whether that be an Olympian and I've been around them, whether it be, you know, a cricketer for Australia and I've been around them too, or whether it be in, you know, a sport like Australian Rules Football, it doesn't really matter what it is. When they stay in their focus areas, it can, from the outside looking in, look like sacrifice. From the inside out, they see that as that is what they need to do to be the best version of themselves. Now, we can call that selfish. We can call that whatever we like. But until we've walked in their shoes, we don't really know what that takes. But there's no one size fits all. Do they get it perfect every time? I'm yet to meet the perfect individual. And I've been around a fair few. So I think what we're always looking for is looking for the best progress we can be in any one moment in time. You know, as a speaker, I, I probably do so many things that are wrong. It's just not funny as a technical speaker, but I'm authentically me. As a coach, I could probably do so many things more, more, more eloquently and probably sharper, but that's the real joy, isn't it, right? So we're always looking for new ways to sell old fundamentals. So I'm never really going to let perfection get in the way of progress. So I think, Elite people from the inside out are just looking to progress. People from the outside in are looking at, you know, maybe what the sacrifices are. I think we have to shift the word sacrifice to say, you know, effectively, this is the opportunity cost. 
And, you know, if I want to be better at what I do, anyone listening to this right now, I don't know everybody listening to this right now. I don't know anyone probably other than you and I, but what I do know, Andy, is this, two things unite everyone who's part of this experience right now. Number one, as good as they're going, they know they could be going better. Mm -hmm. If they think they could be going better, they wouldn't be subscribed to this particular podcast. They're Mm -hmm. looking for something that will help them be better. Why? Because number two, fundamentally, they only feel satisfied when they feel like they're progressing. If you're plateauing in 2023, 2024, you're going backwards. If you sit on the road, you're going to get run over. So Mm -hmm. everyone's looking to progress. So I work in an organisation which started at the start of the year, hoping to be at the top of the mountain by the end of the season. So at the end of the home away season of 23 rounds, they're in front 18 times when the siren sounds. At the end of the finals campaign, they're ahead three times. And most importantly, they're ahead at the most important time, the last game, the last minute of the season, right? So here's the reality with that. The celebrations have gone on long and hard over the last few weeks. But there's a real drive from the inside out to get better. Because if we just go back with the same set up the same team, the same game plan, the, ga- the same everything, the competition is getting better. Well, the world's getting better. I mean, the digital age we're in right now, the demands on us have never been higher. The mm-hmm. expectations from us have never been more higher than they've ever been. This is the first time in human history there are five generations in the workforce, count them, five. So we have to collaborate and communicate far better with our colleagues now than ever before if you if you see anything in in this modern day and age, it's not one size fits all. If you know anything in this day and age, the old saying is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the new mantra for anyone listening to this podcast would be, if it ain't broke, it's probably obsolete for what I need to go forward today. Mm-hmm. So smartphones get upgraded every couple of years. You know why? Because the hardware gets outpaced by the software every two years. That's why you can't do a software update on a smartphone after about year two and a half it's it's, it just won't do it so we've all got to get better uh, and that comes from being very clear on what does better look like sound like feel like and what does more importantly better mean for me as a person i can tell you right now as a husband i've got to be better this year than i was last year because in by the end of this week uh, we're celebrating our 33rd wedding anniversary Hmm. now yeah and we've been together not quite four decades I have to be better, don't I? I have to be better. I'm a father to a 31-year-old. I'm a father to an 18-year-old. I have to be better because my next role as a as a wise person is probably going to be as a grandfather. So we're always on that journey of looking to get better. That's why podcasts like these are really important. We're looking for things that help us get better as best we can be. But I think that's always better if it's done from the inside out, not the outside in. So we're driven by what can we believe about ourselves how can we get better and let's go sort of see if we can start living in the gain of what we've got not measuring the gap of what we don't have I think that's really important too I'd like to get your take on this though so there'll be a lot of people that are listening to the that are listening to this podcast that will be they'll be fairly clear on what they would need to do in order to be better but they are really struggling to come to terms with said opportunity cost of what they're going to need to do to get better. So for example, there will be a number of people listening to this that will um, be wanting to progress in a certain part of their career, for example, or their, their business is about to go up a level and they know they know that it's going to require a lot more time uh, and a lot more commitment uh, in order for that, that next level to be reached. Um, but the opportunity cost is a significant other on the other side of this who is already getting concerned about the amount of time that one is spending in the business, in the organization. Uh, it could be young kids. It could be um, that, you know, the, the opportunity cost could be up to the detriment of a home life in some way, shape or form. For those people that are really looking at it and, and saying, right, the, I I want to get to this level, right? So whatever we're all chasing, like we're chasing a success that we want. Success for me is the probably the selfish component of it in terms of uh, if you were to look at it as 
a career thing or a business thing. You know, you want your business to be successful. It's an ego trip. It's a it's a self validating sort of thing, right? Um, in in many respects, um, but the cost gets to a point where they they feel like they need to choose one or the other. What would you say to those people? Well, I would say that's bullshit. I mean, right. I just I call that out. I mean, I don't think he, I don't think it's for me to ultimately have success. It costs me my family. For me to be, you know, really well with my family, it costs me my business. I, you know, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't live in that space, and I don't believe that space. I think you can have work life flow. Is there sometimes where you're going to be more in your business than your family? Absolutely, and you share that with them, and you say, "I love you more than anything," but Dad needs to focus in here for the next four to six weeks. This is a pretty big contract this is a pretty big project this is a pretty big event called the olympic games i'm not going to be with you for a month as i travel with an australian team somewhere so you know for me the opportunity cost comes when you're not very clear on why you're doing what you're doing if you know why you're doing what you're doing it's very in life i think reasons come first and then answers come second if you find enough reasons to do well you'll find enough answers on how to to make the whole thing work and when people say to me, I just don't have time to do it both, I go, bullshit, you can get up an hour earlier this morning and you can stay an hour later at night and maybe go on six hours sleep, not eight. If you did that, you'd have between Monday and Friday an extra 10 hours in your week. Don't tell me you couldn't be more productive with an extra 10 hours in your week. Mm. Most of the time I'm doing my stuff, my kids are still asleep. Um, <laughs> it just is the way that it is. Mm. You know, I'm the earliest riser you'll probably know. Um, and I'm doing stuff at 6.30 a.m. in my hometown, but it's 8.30 a.m. across in New Zealand. And so I'm talking to people that I coach in New Zealand. They're 8.30. It's a pretty respectable time for them. At 6.30 in my household, then my family's still asleep. Mm. You can still make this stuff work, Andy. So uh, I think it's too simplistic to say you've got to have one or the other. You've got to choose. You've got to be very good in one area or not at all. I, I think you can actually flow in between i'm not saying you don't dedicate yourself 100 in a in a period of time to something professionally but you know effectively it's not work-life balance that will never work no. and that, that's where i think a lot of people get caught up in this whole thing i just can't balance this whole thing out it's going to cost me something somewhere but you can flow into both and so when you're away with your with your kids on a holiday you're probably not doing zooms you're probably not recording podcasts you're probably not coaching people you're just in that moment Yet for, what is it, maybe, I don't know, 50 other weeks in the year, you're probably being productive in that other arena. So there's plenty of time. You can do this whole thing. You just got to work out why you're doing what you're doing. That's really important. If you don't know why you're doing it, no amount of, you know, this sort of stuff is going to help. So you got to be very clear on why you're doing what you're doing. You got to very much be clear on what you value so that when you know what you value, decisions are easy to make, you're in alignment and you'll pay the price. So again, as we talked about it earlier, outside in, it looks like people are making sacrifices. No, they're just making decisions that they're very clear on and they know why they're doing what they're doing. And they'll do what they have to do when they have to do it so they can have what they want to have when they want to have it. But it's not always going to balance out. Yeah, you know, my mentor, the late, great Jim Rohn, used to talk about it all the time. He would just say quite, quite specifically, can you have it all? The answer is yes, if you determine effectively what you value. Once you know what you value, uh, because I value my family, I'm going to work hard to create a lifestyle for them. It doesn't mean at the expense of them. It says in way of honoring them. So I love my kids, but they know that if I'm around them 24-7, I'm probably not <laughs> creating economic realities that helps them get better at what they do. So, you know, for me, Andy, I think it's very, very clear. I call it out when, when I see it because I hear a lot of people giving me the I mean, just unfortunately, you just can't have it all. Well, you can if you know what all is. And once you identify what all is, then go all in. That would be my message. In that respect, do you think that um, one of the... I think I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying there. I think that a lot of people tend to bow to, you know, society's belief in X, Y, and Z, right? Whether it is... Um, whether it is this whole, you know, the the notion of work life balance that is still hanging around like a bit of bad smell, right? Um, or uh, it could be a requirement of how much time you should be you should, in inverted commas, be spending with uh, your spouse, your kids, your whoever it is, right? 
when it comes to those people that, you know, there'll be a lot of people that are struggling to drown out the noise. And this is where I believe things like coaches and whatnot really come into play or accountability partners at the very, very least. Um, but from your point of view, was there a time where you really started to redline with some of this? Because you've you've been, yeah, you've traveled all over the place. You've been on plenty of planes. Like you said, you've been away from home at, for various at various stages and whatnot. Was there a time in your life where you felt you were redlining in one facet of your life or another, whether it is through, I don't know, whether it could be through guilt uh, or economics or or whatever? Was there a time when you really sort of had a an internal battle around any of this? Uh, I, I would love to say so, because then it makes it look like whatever I've done has you know, overcome some massive hurdle. But I don't even live in the red line space. It's not to say I'm not a hard worker. I, you know, sometimes I've gone on four hours sleep and sometimes I've worked for like, you know, 14 hours straight on on something. And, you know, I, I kind of don't say any of that to impress anyone, just to impress upon you that when you're in that moment in time and, and probably writing the book is the best example of that. You know, I started writing the book with no real thought other than, it was a Boxing Day test match that had been washed out at the MCG. I figured oh, I might start writing a book. Now, how long does it take to write a book? I don't know. I don't. No one told me how long it should take, but I would spend fourteen hours a day writing it. Mm. Yeah. It was finished by Valentine's Day the next year, so it was about a six week time frame. And some people told me it took them six months to write the same amount of words, forty thousand words. I don't know what it is for the next person listening to this podcast. It's up for everyone to design it the way they want to design it, but. Have I had it perfect along the way? Absolutely not. But experience is what you get when you don't get the results you wanted. Mm. And resilience is what you build when you don't perhaps get the outcomes you wanted too. But all I know is, for me anyway, it's quality time or quantity time. Some things require quantity. Some things require quality. And I think work predominantly, Andy, requires quantity. I mean, I just don't know any other way of saying it. Mm. I'm yet to find anyone who's been really good at what they do, who's got there without a great work ethic, that has got there without discipline, that has got there without getting up a little bit earlier, staying a little bit later, doing a little extra sessions, whether that be in the gym, whether that be in the seminar training room. I've never yet seen anyone do it. What I found from that is you can spend quality time with your family. It doesn't require the same investment. So, you know, I think for me anyway, that's the way it's worked. Uh, I don't think I've ever redlined in anything because I've never seen it as redline. <laughs> I've just seen it as that's where my focus is going to go whilst I've got every waking hour. I, it was very easy for me to stay stay back late at night professionally. It was very easy for me to get up early and get into a gym. It was very easy for me to get to a seminar room. It was very easy because I'm always on the search for something. But i got to tell you, it's very easy to hang out with my kids in their sporting arenas or in their passion pursuits, whatever they are. That's that's easy too. Now, you won't balance it out. One's going to require quantity. The other's going to require quality. I think your families deserve every bit of quality you can give them. And I think your work desires every bit of quantity you can give them too. And if you get that quantifiably right and you do it for long enough, eventually you come out on the right side, I would have thought. I think the I think the conclusion one of the conclusions we can rate that we can bring from that is is and it comes and it comes sort of full circle to what you mentioned right at the very start is that you know it it really is defined by one's life as to what a high perform what high performance is by definition uh, and you know how one person one person can have no kids and be footloose and fancy free and the other one can have four and therefore success by definition or high performance by definition would have different quantities and different uh, of different quality time and, and all the rest of it um i think one of the one of the big lessons that i'm hoping lots of people are getting drilled into them off, off a number of these episodes now is that it is completely within your control as to how you determine what high performance looks like and it is completely defined by your own world as to what high performance looks like i think that there is i think that people look at the elite so say for example take a an, a, an olympian for example an elite athlete and they hear about the opportunity costs of, of all of the various hours of training and, and exercise and, and all this sort of stuff um uh, diets and so on and so forth um and they sort of 
only ever they they tend to hear about the success, but then they only tend to hear from them again if something goes drastically, dramatically wrong, like their marriage breaks down or they have an affair or whatever the case may be, right? Um, but I think that for for most high performing humans, there is a metronome of it. There, it's like almost metronomic, where they 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 turn up to each day. They they do look the, to how they can best progress themselves in each particular moment. But then they don't allow external noise to dictate what high performance is to them. Would you say that's fair? Very fair. I think. Most high performers, if they don't value the voice, they don't value the proposition the voice is saying to them, i.e. if they don't value the person, if they wouldn't go to that person for advice, they're probably not going to listen to what they've got to say about them in terms of the outside in. So I think we live in the day and age of instant feedback. And, you know, one of the things that I think is really important for everyone listening to this podcast at the moment is be be the be the voice of value to yourself first and foremost and then surround yourself with people who you know and one of the things i love about you you've been to a lot of events that i've done publicly and i'll, I'll always look to you to go are we on track here is there anything we could be doing better here what where do you think we could be going here i've also andy had people at those events come up to me and go can i give you some feedback and it's like well you can <laughs> i'm probably not going to do anything with it <laughs> and like and i used to love people go oh, i could do what you do it's like well get on with it Mm. It's, oh no, I just don't have the time. Then you can't do what I do is what I'm saying in my head. Mm. But you could do it if you, oh, I don't know, got up early, stayed late, did all those things we just talked about. I mean, when you see a high performer performing, Andy, from the outside in, we see performance and results, but I'll show you process. Yeah. And I guarantee you their process is probably more disciplined with their time, more disciplined with their use of, their resources, with their talent. The world is full, like full. Jump on YouTube and just have a look at how many talented people can sing notes probably better than, you know, Tay-Tay or (laughs) can sing uh, a high note better than Celine Dion. But they don't get the same A, reward, B, adulation, C, all these other things because effectively... Talent on its own is not enough. Mm. It's more than, t- it's the process. What process are you in? I've often said to you, you know, we've got to be better marketers of what we do than doers of it. Mm. You can be the world's best coach of all time. If no one knows about you, how are you going to be able to offer the wisdom and benefit of what you've learned in your life experience to help the people you coach take shortcuts to get ahead of the game? Um you know, it's all about better marketing than doing it to a degree. I don't know whether you think Arnold Schwarzenegger is a great actor or not, but he's getting paid a truckload of money to play one role, the Terminator, because only he can play it. He's a better marketer of what he does than a doer. I don't think you'll ever see him win an Oscar, but that don't matter. He's very clear on why he's doing what he's doing and he's getting in there and he's doing it. So, you know, I think high performance, outside in, They've got some special DNA gifts. They're talented. They were born lucky. They had the right sort of coaching. Uh, all that could be true, but there's a lot of elite athletes that come from the wrong side of the streets, that come from the wrong side of advantage. They've taken their best God-given talent and they haven't just coasted there. They've worked their backsides off. And again, their process has probably been dedicated to a strong work ethic, a great use of time, uh, openness to coaching, preparedness to you know work at their craft and put that in over time you know you don't climb Everest in a step but step by step a few acclimatizations at base camp a a bit of change to equipment maybe a bit of change to you know thought set and away you go again so you know I I just think we're on a journey none of us are the completed product I'll be finished the day I'll finish is probably the day you're speaking at my funeral, giving a world-class eulogy. I wish I had heard it. Maybe record that for me now. Um, <laughs> we're, all, we're, we're all on the journey, aren't we? And so will we get there? I, I don't like perfection because it's really, I think it's unattainable. Um, you know, I, I, I truly believe in progress though. And that's something we can all get good at. And if you, if you stick to your process over time, you will get the outcomes that make people go, Wow, I remembered him when he spoke to seven people. I mean, my first public event was seven people. 
my next public event was 14 people. The one after that went to 60. And it kind of grew from there. Now, in time, um, I can get into a room of a size I want at a price point that I set to share information that I truly believe in. But that just didn't happen one step. You know, there's lots of steps to go into it. So anyone who's, who's got great results at the moment, you show me someone with great results, Andy, I'll show you someone who's really committed to their process. I think everyone listening here just has to be very clear. What is my process around time? Is it time management or choice management? Is it time management or behavior management? Maybe choose your behavior in any given period of time and watch how your time usage goes up. So am I a, a good operator in my field? Be a better marketer of what you do. Let's see how the opportunities increase then. Uh, am I winning every time I'm in the arena? No, but I'm showing up more often than not. So if I show up more often than not, I've got a much better chance of getting a win. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not winning, I'm learning because I'm getting an experience and experience is what I get when I don't get the results I wanted. So I'd be spending a lot of time working at what you do. It's the most simplest thing I can offer anyone listening to this right now. Get very clear on why you're doing what you're doing. Know what you value in the game of life. There's your inner compass. Start working along what, what you truly value as a person. Get up probably an hour earlier than you do right now. It's it, You can do it. Trust me, you can do it. And when the alarm clock goes off, don't hit snooze. Just get up, get going. Before long, you won't be waking up to an alarm clock. You'll be waking up to, I cannot wait. This is another day where I work on my process to get better at what I do in all areas of the game of life, in all areas. And understand that it's going to be quantity time in one area and it's going to be quality time in another. And that will flip depending on where my needs need to be. And if you communicate that with your loved ones, if you communicate that with yourself first and foremost, you've got a much better chance of getting in there and, and making the whole thing happen. But success isn't hard. We make it hard. Mm. <laughs> success is challenging. We make it challenging. I think, you know, for me and my thinking right here, right now, as I wake up every day, Andy, as I wake up every day, as I take my first conscious breath from coming out of a sleep in a slumber, I, as I make my first conscious breath, I think as I take my first breath, someone's taking their last breath. What a great opportunity today. I'm waking up next to the love of a great woman. I've been so fortunate to have her in my life. We have three amazing kids. They seem to be doing pretty good at what they try and be, which is good citizens. They're not hurting anyone. They're following their life passion. They're in really stable places in their lives. Have we helped with that? Absolutely, because Gay and I, my wife, we just see us, our role as being CEO of our child's dreams and aspirations, and we give them every opportunity for that to happen. But the one gift I've given all of our children, I would like to think, is the gift of example. Get up early, stay a little bit later, work a little bit harder, do a little bit more than what you're paid to do. That's your investment in your own personal development. Offer more value than what you're asked to do. That's your gift back to your community. Do a little bit beyond what's expected. That's the gift back to the world. And if everyone lived in that abundant space, what a wonderful world it would be. So let's just keep doing that sort of stuff, I would have thought. I could talk to you for a hell of a lot longer. And there's, <laughs> I think we need to probably get you back on for part two, Rick, because there's there's things I want to talk about in terms of, uh, you know, modern day pressures and whatnot around, around time and choice and behaviors and whatnot. So I'd love to get you on for a part two. Um, but I think that's a tremendous monologue to end this first part on because, team, you've got to just take a second to marinate on what Rick's just said. Everything that you want is within your control. And we're not even saying that with any degree of fluff or cliche or any of that sort of thing. Yes, you know, there's going to be a certain bit of DNA that might prevent you from becoming uh, the next LeBron James or <laughs> whatever, or Simone Biles or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but if we're to look at, if you're to look at your life and, and really set a course and, and plot a trajectory towards a, a, a finishing point where you can say wholeheartedly that I have been, a, I am a high performing human being. And this is what success looks like to me. And these are the people that I want to bring on the journey with. The course can be plot relatively easily. And I'd love that Rick's just said quite bluntly, we make success hard. We put it on a pedestal and think that it's something that we can't do. 
But ultimately, everybody bleeds the same, breathes the same. So why can't anybody listening to this podcast get to wherever anybody else is within their sphere of within their sphere or within their industry? Why can't you get to that? Why can't you? So Rick, thank you so much for 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 this. And 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 on yeah, without notice, I've I've committed you to a second part of this. Um, <laughs> um so which which uh, which I hope well, I'm sure you'd be happy with. I'm sure. Um, anyway, um, but team, um, I'm gonna pop uh, a couple of things into the show notes for uh, for this episode. One of them is obviously links to to Rick's. Uh, socials and website and whatnot. I'm also going to connect you to another podcast that he's been working on for, he was working on a few years ago. Um, I believe it's coming back. Am I right in saying it's coming back? Yeah, it's um, one of those things where here we are just talking about making decisions around time, but it is about, uh, you know, I do it in collaboration because I don't do anything on my own, as you know, and uh, it's um, it's a work in progress with my partner in crime, but uh, but we've got something like 75 episodes there from everything from Olympic champions through to, you know, elite, um, you know, sports people to, you know, just everyday achievers in their field and industry so it's a it's an exciting sort of opportunity from that one but again you know i'm just happy to be on this podcast but in anything we're sharing uh it's been my absolute pleasure to be with you today so you know i look forward to the second invite and um yeah hopefully we can continue to add value because that's what i love to do and you do plenty of that rick thank you so much team thank you for listening and tuning in make sure you stay safe stay healthy stay happy of course And we'll look forward to catching up with you and Rick very, very soon. Take care, team. All the best.